So let's start with the first guy. So today I like to prove not P and not Q implies uh, not P or Q. Uh, by the way, these are like properties, the first two are properties how negation is distributed over OR and AND operator. So here the negation is actually distributed, so not P, not Q, and the negation of AND becomes OR, and here the negation of OR becomes AND, I'm sorry, negation of AND becomes OR, all right? So it's very intuitive. And this guy is actually, if you have a conditional statement P implies Q, well, then you know what? This is equivalent to saying not P or Q. If you actually draw the truth table of these two arguments, you're going to see that this is true whenever this is true and this is true whenever this is true. So they're equivalent in, and, and false whenever this is false, this is false whenever this is false. So they're equivalent, meaning equivalence always means uh, uh, their truth values are the same. <coughs> and in fact, um, just a, a bit of hint, if you want to prove a complicated theorem uh, using sort of small theorems like these are always going to make your life easier because, you know, these are sort of shortcuts. Um, I don't know if you ever done computer programming. Uh, I remember when I was a, you know, undergrad student, I, I learned, what was this? Uh, it was an ancient program. Um, it wasn't C, uh, but it was... Anyway, I forgot. Uh, some sort of Fortran or whatever. So the computer programming is, is kind of the same thing, right? Now you have like if-then statements, if-then statements. So if you're not an experienced sort of programmer, you may write a, a, a computer program uh, sort of a number of lines is like thousands or, you know, two hundreds. But actually an experienced computer programmer can use sort of short programs, you know, uh, and then the entire program, original program becomes like five or six lines only. Um, so you can always, once you prove those theorems, you can always use them later in a more complicated theorems. But as I said, I mean, this is not a course in propositional logic. And so uh, we're going to stop here. We're not going to prove anything more complicated than these. All right, so this is a conditional sentence, so I assume this. So not P and not Q. Um, in your answers, what do I expect? You should always uh, write a table like this, which I'm going to create, and that's enough. You don't need to make any verbal explanation, but this table is enough because it always tells me <clears throat> Uh, where those lines are coming from. That's important part of a proof because as a reader, I need to understand whether you're making up this line or are you actually uh, deducing it from uh, uh, previous arguments and by using the inference rules. So for example, this comes from assumption for conditional derivation. So that's enough for me. Uh, but if you like, you can, you can write this for yourself for the sake of you know, uh, remembering why you did it when you did it. So you can say ACD, assumption for conditional derivation, to prove uh, not P and not Q implies not P or Q. All right, so if you like, you can put some sort of a short note like this. So you make an assumption of this, but you want to show therefore this. Or you can say, I want to show, want to show, not P or Q. Again, I don't need any of those, but I need you to write down ACD. Second, uh, well, because this is end statement, always break down into smaller pieces. Not P and not Q. Well, they are all simplification of this argument one, right? Simplification of the argument one. Perfect. What else? You see, I am actually doing a direct proof here, uh, but you know what? These three, now my premises, I cannot really go any further. I mean, I can say something like not P or not Q. I can say not P or Q, um, or I can say uh, a P or not Q, right? Using the inference rules. But what are they going to bring me? I need P or Q 
inside the parentheses and a negation in front of it. So none of them are going to actually help me reach there. So I'm kind of stuck in a direct proof, right? So use the indirect approach at this moment. What does that mean? And I also remember I said always try to get rid of this negation sign. So deny this conclusion. So in line four, I'm going to deny it, meaning not not P or Q is a correct answer. Uh, I'm sorry, statement. So this is assumption for indirect derivation. Um, so whenever I have assumption, that means I'm opening up a new box. And so at the end of the proof, I must be closing these. Uh, now I have two boxes. I have to close these two boxes at the end. Sorry. So what is this not not P and Q means? Always simplify your argument. So this is thanks to double negation. It's P or Q. A double negation of the argument for. Okay, what else? From this moment on, I can't really go any further, right? Uh, I can't say, for example, P or I can't say Q because this is or statement. Well, then look at, remember, this is a contradiction uh, type of proof. I, I, I like to reach a contradiction at some point. So always try to see and, and look at your previous uh, arguments, which are assumed to be true. So here I have not P, I have P or Q. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if you know the rules by heart, you know this is modus tollens, right? I'm sorry, this is a modus tollendo ponens, a pon ponens. Of, I'm, I'm terrible with the Latin names. Um, but the thing is, the idea, the logic is the following. Look, not P is a true statement. What does that mean? If not P is true, P must be the false uh, statement. So P has a, a truth value of false. So if P is false, I know that P or Q is a true statement, so therefore Q must be true. That's it. Right. You don't really have to memorize the rule. Um, so therefore, this is uh, uh, Q. This is modus tollendo opponents between the arguments 2 and uh, 5. Okay? Um, and by the way, I mean, just make a list of inference rules. As I said, there's like 9 or 10 of them. And, and you can always keep those, you know, uh, inference rules next to you. And so you don't really have to memorize the names. Um, it's not the key thing. What else? Oh, by the way, I could apply modus tollendo opponents by using not Q and P or Q. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't change anything in this uh, proof. I would still get a contradiction. Instead of Q, I would get P, but not P is going to contradict with P. Here, not Q is going to contradict with Q. All right. So in seven, I already see the contradiction. I'm just going to repeat it. I mean, uh, this is just an extra step. Actually, you don't have to take this step, but well, just for the sake of argument. Uh, I just want to show you that there is a contradiction. Uh, I just repeat the argument in three. And so Q and not Q can't be happening at the same time, right? I mean, uh, Q is either true or false. So if Q is true, uh, not Q must be uh, uh, true as well. Uh, I'm sorry, false. Uh, so therefore, but you're saying not Q is also true. So that's a contradiction. But this contradiction cannot be because of Q or P or Q, because they are all a deductive arguments from not not P or Q. Right, so therefore, um, my, my assumption not not P or Q must be uh, problematic. And so it, it can't be true. This must be false. All right? So therefore, uh, I close the box because that was an assumption for indirect derivation. So line eight, I'm going to say, you know what? I already proved uh, P or Q. Remember, my purpose when I made this first assumption was to show that not P or Q is true, which I did. So I'm basically done. Now I'm closing my second uh, table. Line 9, I'm just going to write my initial argument. Not P and not Q should actually imply not P or Q. And that's it. That's the proof. So in your problem sets, you don't really have to draw these uh, boxes. You can just say line one, blah, blah, ACD. Line two, blah, blah, simplification. Three, blah, blah, simplification of argument one, obviously. Line four. So you don't really have to sort of push some lines inwards or outwards. You don't really have to go fancy. 
Because as long as you give me the explanations, I'm going to understand what you're doing or not doing. All right. So that to me is enough. But this sort of helps many people understand, well, uh, you know, uh, the proof, uh, uh, understanding the proof is, is getting easier when you sort of make this sort of tables and boxes, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is sort of the longest or the shortest version uh, of your solutions. Any question about this particular um, result? Uh, yes, Professor. Yes, go ahead, Adam. So, uh, it doesn't really matter how we distribute the negation signs, ultimately. I mean, as long as it's correct. But, but well, well what, what, when you say um, doesn't matter how you distribute negation signs on distributing as where? As in, like, when you, like, from, eight, from line 8 to 9, you kind of switch um, the negation, right? You no. apply the negation to each uh, atomic sentence or each uh, element, P and Q, instead of having it in a bracket outside. Yeah. But remember, this is the statement I'm trying to prove. Mm -hmm. Right? This is my starting point. Okay. So uh, the, the, my argument is telling me the following. It says, look, if you have a, a negation in front of P and a negation in front of Q, well, this argument it actually implies, meaning if this is a true argument, well then you can pull this negation uh, and put a bracket, but then P and Q will be left alone and this N is going to become OR. All right? So this is what this statement tells me and I, I just proved it. Uh, the, in the, pro the problem set question asks you to prove the opposite, this. It says, well, now I have this negation site in front of the parentheses, and I can actually distribute this negation site, all right, on P and uh, or and, and Q. Uh, how so? Well, it's going to become not P, uh, or is going to become and, and Q is going to become not Q. So this is the part you're going to prove in the problem set. And obviously, the logical deductions are not going to be exactly the same as this one, somewhat you know, relate it, uh, but its proof is going to be different. And, and the reason for this is because when you prove something like this, your initial assumption is going to be different. All right. So once your initial assumptions are different, obviously your, your logical deductions, your conclusions will also be different. And so it's a different proof. Is, is that clear?